Good evening, everybody. Um, I apologize in advance. We're having some technical difficulties. We're going to um, try and get everything set up here very shortly. Um, in the meantime, we're going we're gonna, to uh, switch up our order a little bit, and we're going to start with questions. We have two of our three panelists here. Um, so if you have questions, I'm going to um, introduce you to our panelists. And while I'm introducing them, you can start um, with questions you may have. You can submit those in the question box which is to your right, um, and we'll get to those. Uh, and then once we get everything going here, we'll, we'll get to the presentation. Um, my name is Christy. I'm part of the team here at the Student Doctor Network, and we're so glad that you guys have joined us. Um, we do have a great presentation for you tonight, and we have three people with a lot of great information in their heads to share with you. Um, we have with us Dr. Jessica Friedman, Dr. Lisa Pilch, and Ms. Lori Tanzi from MedEdits Medical Admissions. MedEdits is the nation's leading medical school admissions counseling company, advising students comprehensively through all stages of the medical admissions process. All MedEdits advisors are former medical school faculty who served on medical school and residency admissions committees, education committees, and hospital committees. These women all have extensive and impressive resumes, but for the sake of time this evening, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to each of them. Um, Dr. Jessica Friedman, who we are working to get on the line here, is a board-certified practicing emergency physician. She served in the residency leadership and on the medical school admissions committee at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine until 2008, when she left to found MedEdits, where she has guided hundreds of med school, residency, and fellowship hopefuls through the application process. Dr. Lisa Pilch is an emergency physician in Chicago, Illinois. She earned her MD from Rush Medical College in Chicago where she has served as a clinical instructor, assistant professor, and on the medical school admissions committee. She also holds an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Lori Tanzi has worked in various aspects of medical education for her entire career. With a background in counseling psychology, she has worked in the medical education departments at Feinberg Northwestern School of Medicine, University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine, and the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She was a faculty member at Mount Sinai and served as an assistant dean of student affairs. She also served in key roles on the medical school admissions committees at Feinberg Northwestern and Mount Sinai. All right, so we are now open for questions. Um, and then uh, we'll let the, uh, the panelists who are here take over, and I'll continue troubleshooting um, yeah. to work on getting everything set up for the presentation. Um, so our first question is, when is the perfect time to submit our med school applications? So I can go ahead and start, and then Lisa can jump in. I think that there's a short answer to that, and then there's a, a macro level answer. And I guess the perfect time to submit your application is really when you're kind of at your peak readiness. Um, this is not a process that can be rushed. You should not submit your application if you feel rushed and if you don't feel like you have done absolutely everything you can in a reasonable amount of time to make yourself the very best applicant that you could be. So that's sort of the macro level answer. I would say um, the quick and easy answer is you want to apply early. So you want to submit your application when the application service is open. So that's usually in early June for AMCAS and also for um, a Comus and the Texas service. So, Lisa, do you have anything to add? No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that your application should be well prepared and it should be a good representation of who you are. So, if that means that you are going to submit, let's say, a week um, later than that June 3rd date or whatever, whatever date it's going to be for that particular year, you should take the additional time really make sure that your paperwork is good, it looks good, it's a, it's a really clear and accurate representation of you, um, and I think that's going to give you your best shot um, at really starting to teach the schools about who you are. Okay, great. Um, our next question asks, how does MSAR work and where should I be aiming in terms of, and where should I be aiming for it in terms of schools to apply? And maybe if you could talk a little bit about what MSAR is for anyone who's not familiar. Sure. So um, as I always say to people, you want to go to the source of 
of the real data. And the best data is the AAMC data if you're talking about USMD schools and um, AACOM if you're talking about DO schools. So the AAMC is the umbrella organization for all the medical schools in the country and the MSAR is the medical school admissions requirements data. Um, they still publish it. You can order a, a booklet and I recommend to do that and you can also get an online access and I also recommend that. It's not that expensive and this gives you access to really detailed information about the previous year's application cycle. You can see how many applicants from in-state and out-of-state a particular school got. You can see how many people they interviewed from in-state and out-of-state, how many um, people matriculated, and you can also see you know, what percentage of the matriculants did research or service. It gives you a real sense for what that school values. So I think this is a perfect place to begin your research, um, and I always recommend that students use that data. Yeah, again, Lori, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, it, it's, it's, again, it's the most accurate version of, of what's happening out there. Um, the next best thing I think that you could do would be to talk to individuals at a particular school that you might have a particular interest in, just to try to get a more personal idea as to what happens at that school. But obviously that's not going to be, um, you're not going to be able to do that for every school that you're looking at, but you should definitely start with MSAR or at least even get to know and, and learn how to navigate the AAMC site. It's got just a wealth of, of information and knowledge for you at, at every step of the application process. Just one more thing, too, about the MSAR data. This is sort of a reality check um, for a lot of students because it gives you a range and also an average of MCAT score and GPAs that were accepted for that previous year. And I think when you see that range, you do need to be very realistic about you know, who's on the low end of that range and who's on the upper end of that range. And you have to sort of you know, think about the type of applicant you are, think about your background, think about your ethnic background too because that certainly makes a difference. And um, just, you know, you might need some help interpreting that data a little bit, but it's, it's a very good starting place, place. Okay. Um, next, this person asks, um, I'm in a six-year undergrad program, not a bachelor's, but still considered undergrad. For AMCAS, when putting in classes, I put in freshman for first year, sophomore for second year, junior for third year, senior for fourth year. Should I put in GR for my fifth year, or is something else more appropriate? I'm not sure I understand the nature of the program. It really depends if the courses you're taking are still undergraduate. I wouldn't label them as GR if they're undergraduate courses. Is, is there anything more specific about the type of program? I'm not sure. Um, Maybe uh, the person who asked this question, if you could give us some more details, and um, we'll see if we can get back to you. Um, but we have plenty of other questions. Um, so, if yeah, uh, we'll move okay. on to the next one and then. Um, Hi, Christy. I think maybe we can start the presentation now. Ah, welcome. Hooray. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. We have lots of good questions. We'll get back to those at the end. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Jessica Friedman, we'll turn things over to you. And, Thank you so, um, so much. Just, I have the slides, so when you want me to move to the next slide, just let me know. Perfect. Okay, okay great. so thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank SDN, and I also want to thank all of you for your patience as um, we navigated some unforeseen technical difficulties <laughs> on our end. So thank you so much for that. Um, we can go on and move to slide number one. Today we're going to be talking about applying to medical school, and while this um, webinar is going to be focused mostly for people who are applying this year in 2016. There will certainly be a ton of useful information that people applying in the coming years can also use. Um, the first thing that I always like to tell people is be honest with yourself. You know, so many people think, you know, I'm not sure if I'm ready to apply, but I just want to get it over with. And 
I'm just going to submit an application and see what happens. And inevitably, those types of situations rarely turn out very well. So the first thing we always ask people to do is really take an inventory of what your competitiveness is. Be honest with yourself. Are you ready to apply? Do you need to do anything to improve your candidacy before you apply? And I recently wrote an article um, for US News and World Report about this topic, why applicants get rejected. That's a pretty good read for people that you can you know, take a look at if you're sort of uh, maybe on the cusp of being ready or not ready to apply. Next, please. So what is the purpose of your application? The purpose of your application is to get you screened in and then it's to help you stand out. So almost all medical schools can be a combination of grades, GPA, um, your, your MCAT, a combination of those two, and typically it's those numbers that will get you screened in. And once we're screened in, then your application will actually be read and reviewed by a member or members of the admissions committee. And it's at that time that you really want your application to stand Well, I think we may have some technical difficulties again. Give us just a second. Okay. Jessica, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you. My gosh. Okay. Yeah. So no, next slide, please. Okay, so how do you stand out? And, you know, sometimes people just want to get really fancy on all of this. They think, my gosh, I want to write a personal statement like no one has ever read before, and I want to say something that nobody has ever heard before. And it's really kind of impossible to do that. As medical school admissions officers, we've pretty much heard it all, read it all. And what I tell people is that to stand out, you don't want to get too fancy. Um, you want to stick with the basics and you want to tell your story because nobody has a story like your story. Next slide. So what are the keys to success in this process? And it's so important to stay calm, to stay organized. Applying to medical school is really it's a it's a long process. There's so many steps involved in applying to medical school. And you know what I tell people is don't look at the process globally. Look at it for each step that it is, right? So at this point, you know, there are a few things you should be focusing on, like getting your application together. Make checklists. I mean, this is all very basic stuff. And, and stay present with what you have to do, be doing now. Don't be thinking forward to, oh my gosh, what am I going to do about the secondaries? And what am I going to do about interviews? And how am I going to get from here to there? And what am I going to do about my finals if you're a rising senior? You know, so stay present, stay focused on the task, at, tasks at hand, and this will help you not to get overwhelmed. Next. So what are the major tasks that you need to do as you're thinking of applying to medical school? And hopefully some of you who are applying for this year have already done some of these things. Um, first, you need to figure out who's writing your letters of reference and you want to request those letters. You also want to request transcripts from any school at which you've taken any undergraduate courses. You want to um, figure out your biographical data. That should be pretty easy. And you also want to compose a personal statement and your application entries. Next. So let's first talk about letters of reference. Um, ask early. Hopefully you've already asked at least some of your professors and your mentors and your advisors to write letters of reference. Um, the earlier you can ask for letters of reference, the better, because at this stage in May and June, people are just overwhelmed with requests for letters of reference. So the earlier that you ask, the less stressed the letter writers are. Okay, um, I recommend asking at least two for at least two science letters from science professors, either basic science, upper level science professors. 
Um, I know that there are some students who go to huge universities where they have, you know, hundreds of kids in their class and sometimes it's very difficult to find a professor who knows you. For those of you who are listening to this who aren't applying for a few years, be proactive. You know, make sure that your science professors know you because you're going to need those letters of reference. I also recommend at least one humanities letter. Um, and at least one character reference, being from, you know, a volunteer supervisor, someone whom you've shadowed. Shadowing letters are not considered science letters. Great letters to get are also um, anyone with whom you've done a scholarly project, like any type of research. Doesn't necessarily have to be science. You know, anyone with whom you've done any type of scholarly work is terrific. Um, remember, everyone has his or her own style in terms of how they like to write letters and the process that they like to go through. So some people may want to meet with you. They might want to sit down with you. Some people will just ask you for your resume or your CV. Other people may ask you for your personal statement. Some professors and some people writing letters will say, my gosh, I have no idea what to write. What do I do? And the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, has a wonderful pamphlet for those people which will offer some guidelines regarding what they should highlight in their letters of reference um, and the link is below but you can always just google this you know AMC letters of evaluation guidelines to find that for them and every once in a while a professor may say look I don't know what to write you write the letter for me and some people think that that's unethical but it is done a lot um, more often than you may think and what I say when people are asked to write their own letter of reference is take advantage of that opportunity um, and write a really good letter because ultimately the person who is submitting that letter needs to sign it and needs to endorse it so you know they may add to it they might you know modify it slightly Next. Um, transcripts, so important, okay? Your application will not be verified until all of your transcripts are in. And why is this important? Because a human being will literally sit down and will look at all the coursework that you have entered on your application and will compare that to your transcripts to make sure that everything that you've put down is perfect and is, is accurate. So it's really, really important to get all of your transcripts in. Late transcripts often will delay processing of applications. And also remember, get unofficial copies of the, your transcripts for yourself because when you enter this information in your application, it also has to be accurate. So you want to have all unofficial transcripts for your own reference as well. Your biographical data, this is a crucial part of your application, right? Your name, your address, you know, all of your personal information, as well as all of your coursework, okay? This may seem somewhat monotonous, but these details are so important. So you want to do this when you're awake and alert and, you know, and sort of excited to start your application because, you know, this information is really, really crucial. Next. The all-important personal statement, and this is really what people are so focused on. Um, with AMCAS, which is the Allopathic Medical School Application System, you have 5,300 characters with spaces to explain um, why you want to be a doctor, and that really becomes the major emphasis of your personal statement. And what should you do in your personal statement? First of all, make it personal. It needs to be about you. It's You, know, you need to tell your story. Um, Try, don't use your personal statement as a place to lecture. You don't want to write about your views in medicine or why the healthcare industry is, you know, in such bad shape. Um, you, you want to use your personal statement to tell your story, to highlight those aspects of your background and your path to medical school that has been the most pivotal and the most influential to you, okay? Realize that you can't include every single personal, every single experience in your personal statement and no one expects you to. You really want to highlight those experiences that are the most crucial, okay? When possible, try to show rather than tell, okay? Or, or show and tell, all right? And you're going to hear this a lot from admissions people. And what that means is you want to, when possible and when it's appropriate, you want to try to use anecdotes or stories to illustrate your points, to illustrate your values and your ideals and your goals, okay? But at the same time, it's important to tell. You have to explain why you've done things. You have to explain what you've learned from experiences. So your personal statement should sort of be a balance between show and tell. All right. 
while your background information, sort of who you are, how you grew up, what your upbringing was, your background, that's important, but you really want your personal statement to focus on your more recent experiences, especially those that are related to medicine and science and community service. Next. The other really crucial part of your application are your application entries, and these are as important as the personal statement. Most students tend to focus on the personal statement, but your application entries are equally important, and in fact, some admissions committees will pay more attention to your application entries than they will to your personal statement. In AMCAS, you can enter up to 15 experiences, and three of those experiences you will identify as being your most meaningful experiences, and those for those three entries, you will have additional space to elaborate on why the experience was really important to you. In the ideal world, if I could, you know, advise applicants, I would I would recommend that they choose at least one scholarly experience that can be any type of research or, you know, in-depth project and at least one type of clinical exposure, okay? However, that said, your most meaningful experiences should reflect what's most important to you, okay? If you're picking three sports entries as your most meaningful, however, maybe medicine isn't really what you want to be doing. Um, you know, so, so try to balance your most meaningful experiences if possible. And in writing about these, don't just write about, you know, what your roles were, what your responsibilities were. You want to write about what you learned from each experience, you know, what you observed, what insights you gained. So the more introspective and the more reflective those entries can be, the, the better off you will be in terms of how they are um, perceived by the admissions committee members. Something else that a lot of applicants stress over is they say, my gosh, but you know, my most meaningfuls are also what I want to write about in my personal statement. And, you know, people in their 20s, even in their early 30s, it's not as if you have, you know, 10 different most meaningful experiences. So for, you know, basically every applicant with whom we work, there is overlap of topics between those topics that are addressed in the personal statement and those topics that are also selected as most meaningful entries and that's perfectly okay. When you do that you just want to take a slightly different angle in terms of how you write about that topic in those two different documents. You certainly never want there to be any duplications in your in your entries and in your personal statement but you just kind of want to write about it from a slightly different perspective in each. Next. So what are your keys for success in this entire process, not only in writing your application, but also in interviews and in everything you do in medical school admissions? You want to be authentic. You want to be honest. Um, you know, when, when you're writing your application, you need to remember that the person reading your application knows nothing about you. Um, I also encourage people to consider every single piece of their application as a standalone element. Okay, so when you're writing your personal statement, don't sort of think of it from the perspective of, oh, well, they'll know oh, where I to school and they'll they'll know what courses I've taken. Assume that the person yeah, reading your application, yeah. reading your personal statement, reading your entries, if you say know nothing about you, that they haven't read anything, read anything yet. You also want to make their job easy. And the way that you do that is you don't want to force someone to kind of go back and try to figure things out and connect the dots. Um, this is why your personal statement should ideally tell your story. It should flow chronologically. So you, you don't want to confuse your reader. You want to make reading easy for them. Okay, so when, when you're reviewing your application and when you're reviewing your personal statement, you want to say, okay, would this be easy for someone to read if they knew nothing about me? Okay, um, and as I've said, telling your story should be the easiest thing you do because Nobody understands you and your motivations and what you've done and why you've done it better than you do. So what I tell people is if this is a really, if this is difficult, you're sitting down to try to write your personal statement and you're just having the toughest time, in some way you're trying too hard. You know, so sitting down, writing your story, explaining what you've done, why you've done it, and why you want to be a doctor, if that's really what you want to do, this shouldn't be a difficult task. Um, I've gone over a lot of this already, but just sort of to reiterate um, some keys for success. When possible, show, don't tell, right? You want to use anecdotes, you want to use stories when possible. 
be reflective, be humble. No, nobody wants an applicant who's boastful, who writes about how terrific they are. Um, you want the reader to come to that conclusion on their own, to say, oh my gosh, this is a really motivated, smart um, you know, person who I want to be part of my medical school class. You also want your letter writers to be the one who boast about you. So never ever boast in an application. Speak from your heart. Just be honest. Okay, so, you know, write about sort of you know how you feel about something. Um, also, try to stay away from empty phrases. Things like "it was rewarding" or "this was really meaningful to me." Um, you know, whenever you review your documents, ask yourself, okay, does that can that phrase? Can, do I need that phrase or do I need that word? Is it doing anything for me? So stay away from empty phrases and you know really make every word and every sentence count. Hey Jess, can I jump in really quick? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I just want to just reiterate what you're saying here. And just also to remind the audience, these in, the, the individuals who are screening your applications and making the decision about whether or not they're going to bring you in for an interview are reading a lot of applications. Mm -hmm. And so be succinct. Really tell them what they should know about you. I know all of you are very respectful and think, oh my gosh, all these people that are screening this, they're so smart, they're doctors, and that yes, they are, but they're reading a lot of them. So be be clear about what it is that you want to say. Be clear about what it is that you bring to the table and, and teach them. Doctors love to be taught. So I couldn't emphasize that more, which is exactly tell your story, show them. Um, you know, if you use empty phrases and you put 10 people in a room, everybody's going to have a different idea of what that means. But the reality of it is the most important part is what you think because this is your application. So make this a very personal application. Tell me what I should know about you. And I think that goes back to also making it easy. Again, there's a lot of applicants being considered. And the more confident that you appear, um, the more humble you appear, the more kind of self-analytical as well. Um, that you can tell me about you, the more comfortable I feel than recommending you to be brought in for an interview. Right. Yep. Okay, next. So I guess everything we're saying, <laughs> it's not rocket science. And I use this slide all the time because it's not. You know, everyone, you know, will, will say, well, what are the secrets? And I would say there really aren't any secrets. If you've worked hard, if you've studied hard, if you've done well in school, if you've you know um, pursued research, you've pursued activities related to patient care, global health, public health, you know whatever your interests may be, you're ready, and um, there really aren't any secrets to this process. For those applicants who are also applying to osteopathic medical schools, and certainly there are many, many applicants who apply through multiple application systems, um, the most common being AMCAS, um, which is the allopathic or the MD application system, but then there's AA Comis, which is the osteopathic application service. Um, something to keep in mind is that the osteopathic personal statement is much shorter than MCAS. So the MCAS personal statement is 5,300 characters with spaces, and the AAA Comus um, personal statement is only 4,500 characters with spaces. The other important thing in AAA Comus, a lot of people say, well, can I just use the same personal statement for MCAS as I'm using for AAA Comus? And you know, what we advise is no, you really can't do that um, because in your AA coma statement, you, you need to gear it more for osteopathic medical schools. There's, you know, it's a different philosophy, um, a different approach to medicine, and there really is not a one-size-fits-all type of essay that will work for both. So your AA coma statement really needs to address why you are specifically interested in osteopathic medicine. You want to try to highlight those experiences that might more directly relate to the ideals of osteopathic medicine. Um, so don't don't try to squeeze your MCAS statement into AA Comus. It, it just it generally just doesn't work, and they can tell when you've tried to do that. If I needed it, you've tried to do that. Um, next. Okay, so the other application service is TMDSAS, which is the Texas Application Service. So we certainly have students who are applying to one system, two systems, even three systems. Okay, as I've already mentioned, the personal statement for MCAS and ACOMIS need to be completely different. Okay, however, the personal statement for MCAS and TMDSAS 
you can use the same personal statement for those two because the character um, limits are similar. TMD SAS character limit is 5,000 with characters. So as long as you you know keep your statement to that amount, you can use the same statement for both of those systems. Your application entries, the descriptions that you write, um, the limit you have for AMCAS is 700 characters with spaces. For AA Comus, it's 750 characters with spaces. So what I advise so applicants to find for both systems is to use their application entries for both systems, they don't need to be changed. Um, the TMD SAS application entries, however, are much shorter. They're only 300 characters. Um, so for those, it's very nuts and bolts, um, completely different than AMCAS and AA Comus. And also for TMD SAS, you have up to three um, essays that you need to write, additional essays, which are 2,500 characters each. Um, one of those is required. One of those is not required, but it is highly recommended that you um, you do complete it. So therefore, I say that one is required, and then one is truly optional. So the P students applying to TM, the SAS, um, and MCAS have have a lot of work, <laughs> but it can be done. It's done every year. Um, I tell everybody: apply early, apply early, apply early. Don't procrastinate and Sometimes a lot of students listen, but sometimes a lot don't. And you know what is considered early? People sometimes think, "Gosh, to be early, I have to apply the second that AMCAS opens." Um, that really is not the case. If you submit an application any time in June, you are early. Okay, um, the earliest that applications are submitted to med schools is going to be the third week of June. So applying any time in June really puts you in a wonderful position um, to be reviewed very early in the process, especially if you're speedy and completing your secondary essays. Um, applications can take literally anywhere from 24 hours to six weeks to be verified, and that verification time, you know, um, grows as the season moves on simply because you know AMCAS ends up with more applications as the season progresses. And you know, why does it matter to apply early? Um, you know, it's pretty simple. When when you apply early, you're competing with fewer people. Your application is being considered with, you know, in a smaller pool. Um, and there simply is less competition. You're also, as you apply later, um, and interviews are already being extended, you basically are competing for fewer interview slots, um, and you're competing for later interview slots, in, in, you know, later in the season potentially. And the other tremendous, tremendous benefit when you apply early is that it's less stressful. Students who submit June applications will get interview invitations in August, some are even interviewing late August, September, and they're getting those first acceptances in October. And it, it just made, you know, the rest of the application year for those students is just so much less stressful. When they walk into interviews later in the season, they're, they just have an air of confidence about them that um, is something that nothing else can bring other than an acceptance. And so there, there really is tremendous benefit to submitting an early application. Um, so where do I apply? And this is a pretty big question, um, you know. But number one, it largely depends on your numbers, your stats, your grades, your G, you know, your GPA, your MCAT. Um, you really need to carefully evaluate how competitive you are um, for specific medical schools. Um, you know, for a lot of students, um, their state schools become the schools that are quote the easiest to get into, realizing there's no. U.S. allopathic medical school that is easy to get into, but for some students, depending on the state you're from, some states are a little bit more generous than others. Sometimes the state schools are the easiest to gain acceptance to, and sometimes those state schools are also, um, they offer benefits financially. Sometimes the tuition benefits of going to your in-state school are tremendous. Um, you also have to really consider your geographic preferences. Where do you want to be in the country? You know, are you willing um, you know, to live in, in whatever state. And what I always tell people um, when they're considering where to apply is, well, would I rather go to this school and, and get in, or would I rather not go to med school next year and have to reapply? Um, so that sort of is the question you need to ask yourself when you're considering which medical schools you will apply to. What I also tell people when they often call, they say, well, you know, how do I find the medical school that's right for me? And this, this isn't like college. You know, there, there aren't as many schools to choose from as, as you had to choose from when you went to college. And the curriculums in medical school 
really are not tremendously varied. Um, you know, all medical schools have to cover the same curriculums. And, you know, if an applicant has the luxury of choice, that's incredible. But typically that luxury of choice doesn't come until at the, you know, after interviews, once you figure out if you even will have more than one school to choose from. So lucky applicants will have a handful of schools to choose from. And at that point, you start kind of figuring out which curriculums are, you know, ideally suited for you, which schools have the best opportunities that sort of suit your interests, and where you just feel you fit in the best. Um, you know, but typically those decisions happen once you actually have your acceptances in hand. So what are they evaluating? They're evaluating a ton of stuff. Okay, first and foremost, they're, they're evaluating your academic abilities. Do you have what it takes to be able to succeed in an extremely rigorous curriculum, you know, not only in a medical school, but also in residency, you know, do you have the ability to pass your USMLE exams without any difficulty? Are you committed to medicine? And do you have a demonstrated commitment to medicine? And more and more medical schools are also now evaluating non-cognitive characteristics and qualities like compassion, empathy, your values, are you altruistic, do you communicate? I mean, there's a whole host of you know, um, non-cognitive characteristics that schools are now evaluating. And, you know, there's a huge subjective component, you know, as there is in any sort of admissions process in, in this entire process. So, you know, when they're looking at your application, you know, the person reviewing it, it's, it's almost impossible, I think, not to impose your own subjective opinions um, when you're evaluating an applicant. And that's just the reality of the process. Um, and as I've said, how are you evaluated? Again, really depends on the school. You know, some schools you know, some will have will just have one person review an application and make a decision on whether that applicant is going to get an interview or not. Other people will have a few reviewers and then they'll rank them. You know, some people, some schools will, you know, assign points to different things, including grades and activities and personal statement letters of reference. So this really depends on, on the school in terms of how you are evaluated and how it's, how the decision made is made of whether or not you're going to get an interview. So above all, just stay calm. Don't lose your cool. It's a long process. It's a tough process. And this is why I tell people, if you're not ready to apply, don't, because it's not easy. Um, and you know, if, if you're one of the lucky few who applies early, gets an early interview, gets an early acceptance, that, you know, at a place you really want to go, that's amazing. But for the vast majority of applicants, you know, this process goes on, you know, for anywhere from six months to a year. So it's, it's really important just to kind of stay calm. Some people won't get their first acceptance until April or May. I mean, we have a couple applicants, you know, who were outstanding applicants, in our opinion, didn't get their first acceptances until within the past month, and um, they did everything right. So it's, you know, it's, it's just different for every student, and you just got to stay calm and you got to keep faith. Um, Finally, um, very soon um, I will be publishing a new edition of the MedEdit's Guide to Medical School Admissions. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. It will be coming up very soon. And if you um, want to be notified when it is released, you can sign up for our email newsletter via our website um, and, uh, or follow us on Facebook um, because there's going to be a, you know, the MCAT 2015 is going to be covered in this edition as well as some additional updates. So I think we can now open up the floor to any additional questions. And again, thank you for your patience. And I apologize for the technical problems on our end. <laughs> so as Jessica, it's Lori. As we're waiting on questions, I just had two quick comments about um, a couple things that may be going on this next cycle, mm -hmm. just so that people don't um, get panicked. So the first is, well, the main thing is this new MCAT. And I think that we cannot anticipate how this, well, we can anticipate that it will affect how quickly students hear back. I think there may be more students placed on hold as they sort of get a grip on how to interpret the scores. So I think if people are not hearing back about interviews this year, you really have to recognize that it may be a very different year. So that was one thing I wanted to mention. And the other thing is that 
um, you know, you were talking about having multiple acceptances or or not. And um, the reality is only uh, that 48% of students get only one acceptance. So gone are the days when most students <laughs> are choosing between five wonderful schools. Right. That is just right. not the that's not the landscape anymore. And I think students need to really be realistic that one acceptance is enough. So, you know, go into this with that knowledge and with that expectation. Mm -hmm. And one acceptance, and one is, acceptance amazing. is amazing. You know, it getting into you know, medical school in the United school. States is a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. accomplishment. And, you know, when, when people say, well, what are my safety schools? And I, I say, there's no such thing as a safety school in medicine. I mean, for a few applicants, perhaps there, you know, are some safety schools, but for the vast majority, there's no such thing. All right. Thanks, Jessica. And um, thanks, everybody, for thanks, everybody, for hanging with us. And, yeah. um, and um, panelists, if you guys could all mute yourselves unless you're answering a question, we're getting a little feedback. Um, then you can just pop in as you're as you're ready to answer questions. Um, so our first question, um, let's see, I feel as though I have developed a solid application, but I'm not taking the MCAT until July. Should I wait to apply next cycle? It really depends. Um, it really, it really depends on the stats, on the GPA and on the experiences. So for someone who, let's say, has an upward trend GPA beginning with a 3.0, ending in a 3.6, um, and has some good experiences, but maybe not phenomenal experiences. I might say, wait, okay? There are some applicants, however, they have a 3.9 GPA at a really well reputed undergraduate institution where they've taken incredibly challenging coursework and they have outstanding letters of reference and they have you know, in-depth well, research, in research. Um, and they're very and likely to get what will ever be the equivalent of a 40 on, on the new MCAT. MCAT. For that applicant, that it might be okay to take that July MCAT and apply this year. Um, so it really depends. But um, if you make that decision, you still have to submit a, a June application. You still have to get those secondaries done as quickly as possible. You can actually gain a lot of time by getting your secondary essays done even before you take your MCAT or shortly after you take your MCAT because basically you want your MCAT hitting the door of those admissions offices once your application is already complete. So everything else is done and that's the last piece. Great, thanks. I don't know if you guys have any <clears throat> additional. Any other? Okay. We'll go on to the next one. Um, do I need to submit my rec letters with the primary application? If I don't do that, will that hinder my primary application from being processed? Where are you, Lisa? You wanna... Unmuted. Oh. Okay. Anyway, okay. It, won't, it, won't, it, won't, it won't hinder the application from being processed, but it will but it hinder will the application from being reviewed. being reviewed. So you need, so you need your letters of letters of in, in in order for your application to be reviewed at the vast majority of schools. Majority school. Okay, great. Um, what do you like in a personal statement and what do you not like in a personal statement? <laughs> That's a really general question. <laughs> um, what do we like and what do we not like? We don't like lectures. We don't like boastfulness. And we don't like personal statements that focus mostly on childhood experiences. Um, what we do like is a personal statement that touches on those aspects of your application that are most important, like some background information is really important in terms of understanding where somebody's from, what they're about, how they grew up, um, but that it sort of also explains sort of an applicant's transformation. For a non-traditional applicant, we want to understand what you've done in the past and why you've made the decision 
to switch to medicine. Um, and that's something that sometimes is difficult. In, in general, the more non-traditional applicant, the kind of the more challenging a personal statement is because those applicants have more territory to cover and they need to cover it concisely because even if you have a lot of years to sort of um, discuss in your application, it still is your more recent experiences and those related to medicine that are really vital to discuss. Yeah, the other thing that I don't think you should do during your personal statement is um, talk to the reader about medicine. Very often this individual is a very seasoned clinician and um, so they have an idea about what medicine is and what I'd really like to hear more about is why you as an applicant already see yourself fitting into medicine. Um, so just be sure again that it's focused on you. It's focused on like what Jessica is saying. Tell me a little bit about your path. Tell me about why you think you're a good fit. You can even touch upon you know, how you see yourself practicing, not necessarily choosing a specialty, but really how do you see your whole career evolving um, if it's relevant to the discussion. Um, but just be sure um, also this should not simply be your activities uh, section kind of just placed into prose. If somebody wants to read your activities, they'll go back and read your activities. Certainly again, you can reference the activities during the personal statement, but it, it should not be a rediscussion of what you had listed in your activity section. Right. Okay, and again, great. if you can, during your personal statement, too, like what Dr. Friedman has been talking about, which is this is another great opportunity to um, show us. And so definitely use examples. Talk to me about when I was shadowing, I saw this, or during this volunteer experience. It also re-enlightens the reader, um, just in case they haven't already read your activities, just a little, they get to start to know you again and they can say, oh, hey, why did, I missed that. Let me go back and check that out. But again, this way they're getting a very um, holistic uh, or you know, well-rounded version of who you are after they've really looked at your entire application. Right. Very good. Um, okay, our next question says, if you have more than one degree, for example, another degree that uses grades like pharmacy, which grades can you use? Well, you have to list all of your grades. So if the pharmacy grades are undergraduate grades, those would be listed as undergraduate. If they're graduate, they'd be listed as graduate grades. So, you know, it all, it all needs to be there. I mean, if the prerequisites are taken in pharmacy school as an undergrad, as part of an undergraduate degree, those would all be undergrad grades. So you list them according to what they are. Okay, thanks. I hope that answers the question. I think, I think that makes sense. Um, would you consider taking the MCAT on August 5th too late? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, yeah, that's to, to us, that's too late. And again, you know, if you're a stellar applicant, if you get a, if you have a stellar performance, could you get in? Sure. But, you know, our feeling is always give yourself the best shot. You know, it, why rush things? You know, certainly, especially with the new MCAT coming out and the increased number of prerequisites that medical school applicants now need to have in order to take that MCAT. There, there's just so much that people have to do that I think more and more people are going to sort of now become, quote, non-traditionals. Um, you know, I think the new non-traditionals will be people who've taken a few years off, you know, as opposed to just one gap year, you know. So our, our feeling is always be the strongest applicant you can be and apply once. And, you know, taking out an MCAT in August where your scores won't be released till September, and that means your application doesn't get online, so to speak, to be reviewed until that time. So realistically, maybe it doesn't even get looked at till October. I mean, it, it's putting yourself in a bad position. I agree. The release date for the August 5th um, exam is September 8th. So you've really, everything's got to fall into place perfectly mm -hmm. um, for you to even get looked at even in October and remember by then 
they've really pretty much been running interviews for easily six to eight weeks at that point. Yeah, right. That actually leads pretty well into our next question. And the same thing is true about... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the the next person asked... I I was going to say... Go ahead. Go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> it's sort of like submitting an applic- a late application. You know, when, when people come to us for reapplication analyses and, you know, we look and they submitted the application in October or, you know, September, it's like, okay, well, there you go. I mean, it's, you know, any, anything that sort of makes you a very late applicant is putting you at a tremendous disadvantage. Okay, well, that, that does lead pretty well into our next question. Um, this person asks, I'm an applicant, I'm applying this cycle as a senior, so I will be taking a gap year. Um, what would I choose to do during the gap year in terms of work, for example, healthcare consulting? Uh, oh, would what I choose to do during that gap year in terms of work help me get a, be a better applicant? Absolutely. What you do during a gap year is so important. And why is that? Um, it's because, number one, it's going to give you more to talk about at interviews. Um, it's going to, you know, make you a more interesting applicant, a more mature applicant. And you will also be getting additional letters of reference during that year. So, you know, I, I what I explain to everyone is the medical school application year is a fluid year. It's not as if you submit an application and then you're finished, okay? You're, you're potentially getting off a of wait list. You're potentially trying to bolster your candidacy in order to, you know, be a better applicant. So what you do during that gap year is really, really important. I definitely think that it should also speak to you continuing to be committed to doing this lifestyle and having a career in medicine. So it should be definitely healthcare and medicine related. Um, like Jessica said, it, it gives you the opportunity to talk about something, but it sends a huge message Um, if you are opting to do something that is not healthcare related. Um, Sure, it may actually provide you with literal cash, but I think in this situation you should definitely not only continue to do something healthcare related, but I would also recommend that you continue to do some sort of volunteer activity. Granted, with a 40 hour per week job, um, you can't necessarily do the amount of volunteering that let's say you did as an undergraduate, but I think if you can at least remain engaged in a particular activity that you like doing and that you're passionate about, then when it comes to either a reapp or a further discussion or an interview, you are going to speak sincerely and passionately about this. So I would not only continue to work, I'd also continue to volunteer if you could. Our next question asks, how many, medical, how many medical schools is a norm for an applicant to apply for? It depends on the applicant. Um, but, you know, let's say for the applicant with a 3.6 GPA and a 29 or 30 on the MCAT, I'd say the average is like 25 schools. Um, it also depends on where that applicant is from. You know, so if an applicant is from a state where there are a ton of state medical schools, um, they might say, look, I'd be perfectly fine going to my state medical school and I don't need to go, I don't need to leave the state. Okay, you know, then then the discussion becomes, well, then if you apply to all of your in-state schools, which sort of are the lowest lying apples, and you apply to, let's say, a few reach schools outside the state that you would, you know, sort of your dream schools, then let's do that. So it, it really depends on the applicants, but I'd say most applicants apply probably to somewhere between 20 to 35 schools, really. And again, it really depends on stats and it really depends on how strong their candidacies are and where they want to go. Very good, thanks. All right, this person says, I had a low science GPA as an undergraduate but I've since entered a master's program in biotechnology and have demonstrated a strong upward trend in my science classes. How exactly would medical schools evaluate my graduate science GPA in comparison to the undergraduate GPA? They will look at the most recent grades. Um, They will also look at the MCAT. So does the MCAT kind of match the improved performance? in the graduate level courses or does it match the undergraduate performance? You know, so certainly everyone knows that some students just don't have the focus, the maturity, 
um, you know, there's just a lot of things going on as an undergraduate to, to do well, and then it's only kind of once they get out of college that they kind of get more serious and more focused, and they go to graduate programs or master's programs and they flourish. Um, so it's all kind of looked at together. So assuming that those improved, the improved GPA is kind of matched by an equally strong MCAT, that's going to be looked upon very favorably. Very good. And this um, potentially could be our last question, maybe one more. Um, should I list non-clinical volunteer experiences on my application as an extracurricular activity, things such as volunteering at a church? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, schools want diverse applicants with diverse experiences. They want to know that you're involved in your community um, and that you contribute to your community. So that those those kinds of experiences are very valuable. Okay, great, and um, I think we'll do one more. Um, where in the primary application can I write an explanation for my weak MCAT verbal score? Um, that would be in the personal statement that you would do that, but it would it would really depend on how weak it was if you would even mention it. So, sort of bringing up red flags is kind of a very you know, we sort of discuss that case by case. So it really depends on how weak it is and how much of an outlier it is. And is that low verbal score sort of, you know, um, is it contradicted by other grades you may have in, let's say, liberal arts classes? You know, so everyone's allowed an outlier, you know. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be discussed. It really depends on the overall situation. That's something that would definitely come up in an interview. Um, but assuming it's not something so low that would prevent you from getting an interview, it might not need to be discussed in the application. Very good. Well, I think that is going to wrap us up for the evening. Um, thanks to all of you guys for MedEdits for taking some time out of your evening to spend with us. And uh, uh, thanks to all of you for coming and, and spending an hour with us. Um, we hope it was helpful to you. Um, a couple of quick notes. If we did not get to your question, we'll be posting a list of the unanswered questions in the pre-med forums on studentdoctor.net for the MedEdits team or um, others to discuss and answer. So hopefully you can get your questions answered there. Second, if you want to hear any of this again or share it with anybody else, we'll be posting it on the Student Doctor YouTube channel in the near future. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates on when that will be available. Um, and that will bring us to a close for this evening. Thanks for bearing with us through our technical difficulties. And <laughs> Thank um, thanks both to the speakers and the audience for, for your flexibility <laughs> there. Um, we hope you guys all have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, SDM. Thank you.